Hallelujah. Just while the children are going out and I'm getting organized, I wonder if you could turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy, the book of 2 Timothy, please. I wonder if you could turn to chapter 4, please. This is my text for today from verse 1. I'd like us to read together. I charge you therefore before Yahweh and Yeshua the Messiah who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own devices, desires because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We'll just read a few more verses. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which Yahweh, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. <clears throat> Throughout my sermon today, what I really want to do is to paint a picture for you. I want to paint a picture of what was happening between Paul and Timothy throughout this letter. And in order to do this, I want to begin by showing you something. I want to show you this. Does anyone know what this is? Anyone know what it is? What kind of baton? It's a relay baton, yes. There we go. I guess for those of you who like sport, and we've been hearing about sport, haven't we, the last few hours, only a few hours ago, um, you may well have been tuning in over the years to various athletics competitions, maybe the Olympics or the World Championships, and seen the great rivalries between US, Jamaica, Great Britain over the years. And anyone been watching those kind of yes. battles here? Yeah? And it's been pretty exciting stuff, hasn't it? Yeah. You never quite know whether Jamaica's always going to get it. But um, <clears throat> they hold the world record for the 4 by 100 meters still at the 2012 Olympics. But you know, if you watch the 4 by 100 meters relay race, there are so many things that can go wrong. And that can result in the quickest team on paper actually getting beat if everything doesn't fall into place smoothly in the matter of a split second. For example, do you know that there are three different techniques for passing a baton on? Did you know that? Yeah. There is the up sweep, the down sweep, and the push pass. I bet you didn't even notice that when you were following the relay races, did you? So each of these techniques basically describe two things. The position of the arm of the outgoing runner, and the motion of the arm of the incoming runner. Does that make sense? Yes. Right, so the up sweep, so if I was receiving the baton, my hand would be up here, yes? And the incoming runner would therefore sweep up and hand the baton into the hand that's ready for it. And the down sweep, obviously, is the opposite. I can have my hand here, and the incoming runner would sweep the baton down and put it into the hand of the outgoing runner. The push pass is when the hand is horizontal, like that. 
And so basically you come running, somebody, one or two people actually wanted to demonstrate this, but I haven't really got the time. So you come in, there is a horizontal arm waiting, and you push the baton into that arm, so both arms are horizontal. Right? So three different techniques, and that is actually the most preferred technique these days, the push pass. But there is a word beginning with P, which is absolutely essential if a hand-on is to be a good hand-on and not a bad hand-on. Do you know what that word is? Sorry? No? Uh, there's too many P's going on, I can't hear you all. <laughs> the, the word I'm actually looking for is precision. Precision. Precision is important when passing a baton on during a re relay race as fumbling around of any kind would cause a team to lose valuable tenths of a second in a race where every tenth of a second counts. And while dropping the baton results in disqualification, yes. I guess you also know that there is a zone in which the baton must be passed, else the team will be disqualified. Do you know how big that zone is? It's 20 meters. 20 meters is the, the period or the, the length of time in which the baton must be handed over. If it's outside the zone, the team are disqualified. And what is encouraged, obviously, from what you've seen, is that the most important thing is, for a good handover, is that the incoming runner is slowing down and the outgoing runner is speeding up, is gaining momentum. And I'm saying to you today that that is exactly what was happening when Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. A spiritual baton was being handed over in this letter. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was slowing down. And Timothy was gaining momentum in his ministry. And Paul, even though he was coming to the end of his life, he was not prepared to drop the baton until he knew that it was safely in Timothy's hands. The relationship between Paul and Timothy was a very close one. Paul, it is suggested, was the one who brought Timothy to faith at a very young age, along with his mother. And tradition and biblical scholars believe Timothy was converted to Christianity when he was about 16 years old. And that he accompanied Paul on Paul's second missionary journey when he was about 21 years old. And finally, that this particular letter was written to Timothy when he was approximately 40 years old. So where was Paul when he wrote this letter? Well, there's two kind of main schools of thought. One is that Paul was under very strict house arrest, not just normal house arrest. He was in his own house, or in a house, and he was heavily guarded, and he was in chains. And that is why some scholars believe that he asked Timothy to go and visit him towards the end of his letter, because Timothy would have been able to visit him in the house that Paul was being guarded in. But the other and most popular school of thought was that Paul wrote this letter to Timothy from a dark and damp Roman prison cell just before his death in AD 67 or 68, and that he was in the worst of prisons that Rome had to offer, the Mamertine prison. The Mamertine prison could have been called the House of Darkness. Few prisons were as dim, damp and dirty as the lower chamber that Paul was likely to be occupying in that prison awaiting his execution. Why was he there? Well in AD 64 a fire broke out in Rome destroying 10 of the city's 14 districts. And the inferno raged for six days and seven nights. And rumors swirled that the Emperor Nero had ordered the inferno because he wanted to rebuild Rome according to his own liking. And Nero tried to stamp out the rumors, 
but to no avail. So he started looking for a scapegoat. And since two of the districts untouched by the fire were disproportionately populated by Christians, he shifted the blame to them. And as a ringleader, which is what Paul was called in Acts 24, Paul was arrested and placed likely in this prison. And it's probable that it's from this cell that Paul wrote his final letter to Timothy just before he was beheaded. Certain personal details of the letter reveal this apostle settling his accounts and preparing for the inevitable. At the close of the letter, Paul mentioned quite a few people, some who had been faithful to him in his ministry and others who had deserted him. It's as though Paul was giving Timothy a state of the church address, updating Timothy on the current state of acquaintances and friends that they had remaining so that this young minister, Timothy, could carry on after Paul's departure. Paul understood that ministry would only become more difficult for Timothy with the apostles' impending death. And he knew that Timothy's task of keeping the church within the bounds of sound doctrine while encouraging to be believers to live their lives well for the sake of Messiah would often be a thankless and a difficult task. Though hardship would come, Paul wanted to, Timothy to continue in those things he had learned, drawing on the rich heritage of faith he had been passed down to the young elder, not just from Paul himself, but from his mother and his grandmother. So with all of these things in mind, towards the end of this letter, as Paul is closing, he charges Timothy to preach the word and to be ready to do so in season and out of season. Today, saints, and more specifically, those who are in leadership, and those who are destined to be in leadership in this church, I'm saying that the charge still rings through from Paul's prison cell echoing down through the ages to preach the word and to do it in season and out of season. And this letter raises at least four reasons why it must be so. And here's some alliteration for you. The danger of the seasons, our devotion to the saints, the demand of the sovereign, and the deceptiveness of the sensual. Don't get worried, it's not going to be a very long sermon. The first point is a bit longer than the others. But let's look at these four reasons why it must be so. The danger of the seasons. In this letter, we get a real sense that during T Timothy's ministry, at this time, it was at a critical point things could have gone either way for Timothy. When Paul had last visited Ephesus, he had some spiritual insight into the future of the church at Ephesus. And with that spiritual insight, he called the elders of the church at that time together, and he said this, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops, to feed the church of Messiah, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departing, grievous wolves will, sh will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. And from this dark, damp Roman prison cell, Paul gets the sense that the fulfillment to his own words was about to take place. And he is anxious to convey warning, encouragement and hope to his young prodigy, the one that he had left in Ephesus to care for the flock after his departure. But he also senses that Timothy's having a bit of, rough, of a rough ride. 
And so in chapter 1, verse 6, he says to Timothy, kindle afresh the gift that is within you. And this instruction must have only come because Timothy was wavering. He was diminishing. He was, his, his, his fire was getting snuffed out. He was facing criticism from within the church and persecution from without. And this constant drip feed of negativity and accusation against Timothy caused his gift to be knocked, to be shaken. Church, I say to you today, you have a responsibility toward your leaders. You have a responsibility to support them. You have a responsibility to uphold them in prayer. Do you have any idea what constant criticism, constant accusation, mistrust, and speaking openly about your discontent does potentially to your leaders? Do you have any idea? It undermines them, it serves to discourage them, and ultimately destroy them. And ultimately the church is left floundering without vision and without direction. Timothy, at this crucial time, began questioning himself. Right now, for Timothy, it wasn't a time for, for growth and expansion. It was a time for persecution from within and without, for the things that he had held on to and he was preaching about. And Paul challenges him to keep preaching. It doesn't matter what the season is. It doesn't matter what the time is. Keep preaching what you've been taught and what you've believed. And then in verse 7, Paul goes on to say, For Yahweh has not given us the spirit of cowardice or the spirit of fear. Timothy was not to be turned into a coward at this time. He was to stay a champion of the truth in spite of everything. And here's this apostle Paul. He's put years of investment into this young man. He's the one who left Timothy in charge, a very difficult but necessary place. In fact, Ephesus was probably the mother of all the churches in Asia Minor at that time. Paul put Timothy there to straighten out some things, and it hasn't gone so well. The church has attacked him, and society around him has closed in on him, and is beginning to falter. And Paul tells them to stir up the gift. He tells them not to be a coward. And then on verse 8, he goes on to say, and don't be ashamed of the testimony of Yeshua. And then verse 13, he says, retain the standard of sound words. Hold on to sound doctrine. This was a critical time, not only for Timothy, but in the life of the church. Things were clearly in the balance. Here is a man, the Apostle Paul, coming to the end of his life. He's given all of these years to the establishment of the church and the proclamation of truth. And he is passing this baton on to Timothy. And Timothy is beginning to show signs of weakness and failure. And he called, to, tells him to stir up the gift. Don't be a coward. Don't be ashamed and hold on to sound doctrine. Because you see what happens is, when the pressure becomes too much, the temptation is to begin to soften your message. So that you begin to give the listener what he or she wants, rather than what the word of Yahweh says. And in verse 14, he goes on to say to Timothy, God through the Holy Spirit, the treasure which dwells in us. What is that treasure? It's the truth that has been entrusted to you. And in verse 15, Paul says, don't you know, aren't you aware that everyone in Asia has turned away from me? Please don't add your name to that list, Timothy. This is a frightening time. And after these statements, Paul in chapter 2 goes on, Be strong, my son. Be strong. I'm counting on you. In chapter 3, he says, Realize this, that in these last days, difficult times will come. It's not going to be easy, Timothy. 
It's not going to be easy for you. I can sense it. I can hear it in, in the spirit. But you can't compromise. You can't get sidetracked. You can't become ashamed. You can't become a coward. You can't alter your message. You can't downgrade the truth just because it's difficult. And then in chapter 4, he so, sort of reaches a crescendo and he says, Preach the word in season and out of season. In other words, all the time, whether it's popular or not, whether it's received or not, whether it gives you accolades or brings you execution. And here's why. Because in chapter 3, verse 1, these are difficult times, Paul says. And let me translate more accurately from the Greek. These are dangerous seasons. And the word difficult or dangerous means savage or perilous. He's saying you must preach the word, Timothy, because of the danger of the seasons. I say to you also that today savage seasons still threaten the life of the church. The apostle, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was giving a warning that has been played out in history. The seasons in the church's history define the fulfillment of Paul's prophecy. And I want to just here, just give you a, a brief but potted history of the, the life of the church over the years and the seasons it has faced to this point. The first dangerous season that came into the life of the church in early history on a massive scale was sacramentalism. That is the idea that somehow you connect with Yahweh through mechanical means, some kind of religious ceremony. It's salvation by automatic ritual. The church became like a surrogate for Yeshua and people became connected to a system but not to Yeshua. Do you know it's possible to still be connected, so connected to the church and not be connected to Yeshua himself? Sacramentalism became the enemy of the true gospel. It became the enemy of grace, it became the enemy of faith, the enemy of Yeshua, the enemy of the Bible, the enemy of the Holy Spirit, and the enemy of Yahweh. And true believers were massacred by this system. And it was a grave danger to the church that lasted all the way to 1500. But there was a true remnant of believers through that historical period. For example, the Waldensians and other names of groups that remained true to the authentic word of Yahweh. But nevertheless, it still corrupted the Christian faith. It corrupted the understanding of the word of Yahweh, corrupted the church, corrupted so many aspects, which by the way, it didn't really end in 1500, because even now we still have it being played out in the churches across the world. For example, the Roman Catholic Church and other groups who believe you can connect to Yeshua through some kind of ritual. And then in the 18th century, there came another dangerous season in the life of the church, rationalism. Coming out of the dark ages of sacramentalism when the Roman Catholic system oppressed the people and told people that the, the church was, had the only true knowledge. And after the time of the Reformation, man began to feel his freedom. He began to discover something of the image of God within him. And something of the incredible creativity that he had. And something of the intellectual capabilities. And he began to develop all kinds of skills. And in the 18th century, man decided he was God. For all intents and purposes. And that he would only believe what was rational. And anything that wasn't rational or reasonable to him should be rejected. Man placed himself above God. A human reason above scripture and so rationalism came into the church in a big way it corrupted the protestant church it corrupted the church that came out of the reformation the authorship of the bible was questioned the inspiration of the holy spirits was quest scriptures was questioned leaders questioned the truth of the scripture they questioned anything 
and everything in the Bible. And one European scholar, one rationalist scholar, decided when all was said and done, there was only 26 verses that were worth looking at in the Bible. I don't want to go into every historical season of the church, but I'll just quickly mention a few. The next one of the others is liberalism. What is li liberalism? Well, it's where you are told you don't fully have to believe what the Bible teaches about morals and standards. You are totally free and forgiven under the blood of Yeshua. In other words, your happiness is more important than your holiness. Ever heard that said? Your happiness is more important than your holiness. It's not what the scriptures teach, is it? We move into the 1950s and we get the ecumenical movement. That is, do you know what that is? It's unity without doctrine. It's unity without doctrine. And there we find sentimentality, tolerance of error, disdain of sound teaching, lack of discernment, and the ecumenical movement has ripped through the churches in UK and America, shredding it to pieces. And then in recent decades, we've had what's been branded as subjectivism, where man began to look inward even more, and psychology began to replace theology. And the last one I want to mention is what is really looming largely in the church today. Mysticism. This is where the spiritual becomes absorbed with the mystical. Camouflaged in certain forms of meditation. And I say to you, church, today, be careful. Be on your guard, young people, young adults, as this as an infiltration of the New Age movement. To conclude this point, I want to say that there are still remnants of all of these seasons at large in the church today. The remnants of many seasons still lingering, still screaming for attention, still vying for position. And that is why Paul said, be diligent to present yourself approved to Yahweh, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. These are indeed dangerous times and ministers and leaders of the congregation of Yahweh need to know the truth of the word, need to preach the word, need to not be ashamed of the truth and deal properly with all those who hate or challenge the truth. It's not an easy time to be a minister. Leaders are to guard the flock from any infiltrator, any man or woman who is dressed in sheep's clothing, but underneath they are ravenous wolves. And I say Paul would have had no problem excommunicating such people from the church. Society's changing times are demanding that the church accommodates behaviors and choices that are not rooted in scripture, nor was it the practice of the early church. The world's understandings, belief systems, and subtle counterfeits that appear closely reflecting the truth but couldn't be further from it is infiltrating the minds and experiences of believers today. And I say the church needs watchmen. The church needs watchmen to be on the lookout and watching, protecting the flock of Yahweh. That is the job of the ministers. The apostle Paul knew what was to come and he shouts from his prison cell, preach the truth, um, Timothy. Preach the true, authentic, undiluted, uncompromising word in season and out of season when it's popular and when it's not popular. The seasons will seek to still your voice, but shout it from the rooftops without fear or without favor in the hearing of all. Let the seed of Yahweh's true word fall where it may. Yahweh will give the sunshine. Yahweh will send the rain and the fruit of the word sown from your mouth 
will bear fruit in due season. And the second reason Paul gives to preach the word is because of Timothy's devotion to the saints. And so it must be with us. Paul said, but you, in contrast to them, you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecution, sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all, Yahweh delivered me. He says, in contrast to them, Timothy, you followed me. You followed everything about my life. Timothy was wholeheartedly devoted to Paul. Paul was his spiritual father and mentor. Timothy was his prodigy. And Paul was his example, his spiritual hero, his teacher. But we must remember that Paul also, as awesome and great as we think he was, he'd also learned his lessons through the secret of being closely connected to others during his upbringing also and even when he came to faith we think of Gamaliel and we think of Barnabas I, I love the story of Gamaliel in, in Acts chapter 5 I think you're familiar with it Jerusalem was an uproar you know I was, I was listening to the scriptures today that Shirley and, and Fiona were um, sharing with us and I was thinking you know it began in Jerusalem it's going to end in Jerusalem yes. yeah, that's what the Bible teaches I love those scriptures but you know it all started in Jerusalem. These apostles were causing mayhem, spiritual mayhem in Jerusalem at the time. And they were thrown into prison and the angel of Yahweh came in the night, unlocked the prison doors while all the guards were asleep, took them out there, told them to go to the temple, locked the door again, and when the authorities came in the morning, they weren't there. And word had it that they were in the temple. And so they approached them in the temple and they they try to get a hold of them again and Peter rose up and says we must obey Yahweh rather than men and and the Jewish council met together and were trying to decide what to do with them. I mean what could they do if an angel was going to keep um, releasing them from prison I mean they, they had no chance but they were trying to decide what to do and the Gamaliel who was a sound teacher of the law highly respected stood up and he says look we've seen this all before there's what the few have risen up and it's just come to nothing if it's not of Yahweh it's just going to blow out but it, if it is of Yahweh let's be careful because we will find ourselves fighting against him and so he offered this sound wisdom this sound advice and this was the Gamaliel that Saul sat under when he was growing up he must have imparted that kind of wisdom into Saul he must have done and then when Paul came to faith we find that Barnabas took him under his wings. Jerusalem was skeptical of Paul. He'd, after all, he, I mean, he'd threatened all the Christians. He, he wanted to kill them all, didn't he? And then when Yeshua had an encounter with him, his life was dramatically turned around. And all of a sudden, that same zeal that he had was transferred to, to, to Yeshua. And of course, Jerusalem was going to be skeptical. And Barnabas <coughs> bridged the gap between the apostles and the believers in Jerusalem and he somehow brought Paul along and he made him acceptable in that society of leaders in Acts 11 we read that Barnabas was sent out to check on reports of new believers in other regions and he found a thriving group in Antioch who needed shepherding and what did he do? He reached out to this young minister, Paul, and he asked him to come along and, and work with him in this exciting movement. Do you know every true servant and minister of Yahweh needs such a person in their life? Do you know that? They need somebody who is older and somebody who is wiser, somebody who's had years of ministry, who can be a resource of wisdom and knowledge and experience. You know, youth is great for energy. But sometimes it's prone to arrogance, sometimes. And there is little replacement for years of walking with Yahweh and learning in the way. And Barnabas wisely invested in his years of experience into this young man, Paul, while he was benefiting from the energy and the zeal of Paul as a young believer. And then in Acts 13, we read that there was a meeting in Antioch of the prophets and teachers, and the word of Yahweh came. 
And they said, separate Paul and Barnabas for the work which I have called them to do. So this dynamic duo, this father-son relationship, this prophetical teaching relationship became apostolos. They were sent out together. Paul knew firsthand the value of such close relationships in his life. And so it wasn't rocket science that when he was in his ministry, he was reaching out to somebody like Timothy. He wanted to remain spiritually accountable while at the same time passing on his own mission and vision to the likes of Timothy. But you know, such a relationship wasn't unfamiliar to Timothy either. Throughout his life, he had submitted not only to the care and the nurture of Paul, but before that, his mother and his grandmother. Not much is said about these two wonderful women in the scriptures who raised Timothy, but we can be sure they did an amazing job rearing him in the way he should go because when he was old, he didn't depart from it. And I say, well done, Eunice and Lois. I salute you today for what you've done. But I also say to every parent in here today who is trying to raise young children, well done to you. You who are seeking to spend time with your children in the word of Yahweh, opening the Bible, telling stories, enacting and reliving what this ancient book, yet ever relevant book, has done. May Yahweh bless you today, parent, mother, father, for your endeavors, and may your hearts be encouraged as you see your children embracing the word of Yahweh and having it rooted deep within them. By the time Paul wrote this second letter to Timothy, this young minister had been ministering there for about four years. And it's that long since Paul had written his first letter. Timothy had been a faithful servant to Paul since he had left home with the apostle more than a decade earlier. And since then, Timothy had been ministering alongside him for the duration of both Paul's second and third missionary journeys in places such as Troas, Philippi, Corinth, and Timothy was not unfamiliar to the Ephesian church when he settled there eventually to minister because he worked alongside Paul when Paul last visited there for a period of three years. And Paul wrote again to this young leader at the church at Ephesus, providing him encouragement and he's saying, Timothy, all who desire to live godly in Yeshua the Messiah will be persecuted. But he's saying, Paul, Paul is saying, look, Timothy, you have followed me up to now. Why would you turn away? You followed my teaching. You followed my faith. You followed my faithfulness. You followed my patience. You followed my love, my perseverance. And you followed my integrity and stood by me in my ministry. You were there when I was persecuted. You were there when I suffered. In all of this, you have followed me and stood by me. You have been totally devoted to me, Paul was saying. And then he goes on to say, things are going to get worse and worse. Men are being deceived and it's going to be even more difficult. But you, Timothy, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. That's what he was saying. He's saying to Timothy, don't do anything different. You preach the word, not because, just because of the danger of the seasons, but because of your devotion to the saints. You just take the baton and you keep running the race. You don't need to change the shape of the baton. It stood the test of time. The shape is still the same. We don't need to reinvent ministry, Timothy. You just need to get a hold of it and keep running and running with the ministry that has been passed down to you. That is our job. We don't need to change it. It's the perfect shape. Brother, sister, minister, our job is to pass it on and get, make sure it's firmly in the outgoing runner's hand until we let go of it. There is always a moment in time when two hands are on this baton. Always.
The things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In other words, my son, whatever you've heard me say, pass it on. Entrust it to other faithful men and from generation to generation, the church will grow, the church will grow and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Don't do it any differently, Paul is saying to Timothy. Don't change anything. I gave you the truth. I preached it to you. I taught it to you. I lived it. You do the same. Then I come on to my third reason. Timothy is charged before Yahweh and Yeshua to preach the gospel, the demand of the sovereign. Be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You know this is a frightening verse for any minister. In some versions it says, I solemnly charge you. It's a very serious command, but made more serious by the words that follow. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of Yahweh and Yeshua the Messiah, who is to judge the living and the dead and do so by his appearings in his kingdom. Do you know this is enough to strike holy fear into the heart of Timothy? He is solemnly charged. John Knox in his biography said, when I was compelled to preach, I burst forth in abundant tears and retired to my room refusing to come out. Do you know he was frightened at the awesome accountability of that duty? And we who preach, we who lead, are under the same holy charge and scrutiny and accountability. And that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, it's a small thing what men think of me, It's a small thing what I think of myself. I'm accountable to Yahweh. It doesn't matter what men think of you. It doesn't matter what you think of yourself. You're accountable to Yahweh. And one day you will give an account to him, Hebrews 13 verse 17 says. We are under divine scrutiny. Make no doubt about it. And under that divine scrutiny, we preach the word. We have commanded to preach the word and Yahweh and Yeshua are watching to see if we're obedient. I say, leaders, we have an awesome responsibility before Yahweh to be the best that we can be. And I confess that over the years, I have not always been the best that I can be. There are times when I have been diverted. There have been times when I've been distracted. But Yahweh's eyes are always on us. And Yahweh, I have prayed often that Yahweh would forgive me. Because I want to finish the race. I want to run the race to the end. And I don't want to be distracted or diverted from what the calling is on my life. I have many temptations. There are so many things I would love to do. But I can't because I'm a prisoner to Yeshua. I am bound by the chains that lock us together. He is mine and I am his. And he is watching my every move as he is watching your every move. We cannot afford to let go of this baton, brother, sister, until it's safely in the hands of the next generation. We must finish well. We must run the race till the end. And we must finish well. Surely this is enough for us to preach the word. Never mind about the danger of the seasons or our devotion of the saint to the saints. It's the demand of the sovereign that is most important. And I say he has put demands on your life that we cannot get away from. We cannot get away from it. If he says keep the feasts, he means it. He means it. 
He is not talking about something like that. He's talking about something that is very important to him. If he says, keep my Sabbath day holy, he means it. If he says, preach the gospel to all nations, he means it. We cannot get away from it. And I say to you, if you have been diverted from what Yahweh has called you to do before you leave today, we need you, we, me, whoever needs to repent before Yahweh and get things in order. He is the priority in our lives. He has to be the number one. And brother, if your family is not coming with you, you make them come with you. You share what is needed to be shared so that you can bring your wife, you can bring your children along, you can bring your grandchildren along with you. Yes. It's your responsibility. Timothy did not hear the word or his commission directly from Yahweh. He heard it from Paul. And you know, sometimes we hide behind the excuse that Yahweh hasn't spoken to me. He hasn't said it to me, so I won't do it. You know, I'm waiting to hear from Yahweh. I'm waiting to hear from my own special voice. And we wait for a week or a month or a year or a few years and it never comes. Why? Because it's right there in front of us. Because we are accountable to those whom Yahweh has placed in charge of us. And sometimes, sometimes they will speak into your life. And you must take it as the word of Yahweh. Sometimes. It is not just so and so. It is Yahweh solemnly charging you through his apostles through his prophets, through his teachers, through his pastors. May Yahweh forgive you if you think it's just so and so. When it's his word coming through just so and so. We have all been given works in this life to do. Make no bones about it. Ephesians says we are Yahweh's handiwork, created in Yeshua to do good works, which Yahweh has prepared beforehand that we should do. We are not simply called to come to church and keep our seat warm and then go home and, and, and cook our meal and uh, just be with our family for the rest of the week. This is your family. The church is your family as well as your own family. We do life together. This is not what Christianity, New Testament Christianity is all about. The body of Yeshua is your family and the world is your mission. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is given by inspiration of Yahweh and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But why? That the man of Yahweh may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what Paul said to Timothy. And I'm not going to go into it now, even though it's in my nose, but James had an awful lot to say about good works. He was saying, don't get me wrong. Good works is, is not, it's not saving faith. It's not going to save you from your sin. But nevertheless, good works is always an outcome of the saving faith that you have. There can be no other outcome. Actually, it has to produce good works. Otherwise, it's not saving faith. You can't go to somebody on the street and say, Yahweh bless you, son, while he's starving, unless you've got some food to give him. That is the good works that must accompany what you say with your mouth. And I ask you today, what good works are you engaged with, which is an evidence of your faith? What have you been commissioned to do or charged by Yahweh to do? Have you asked him? Are you speaking to him about it? If you can't hear his voice for yourself, submit yourself to someone older and wiser and who's been around a bit longer, who can point you in the right direction and speak into your life. What have you been divinely appointed to do? I ask you, what is it? What have I been asked to do? Brother, sister, my challenge to you is to get on and do it. 
Get on and do it. Stop the complaining. Stop comparing yourself to somebody else. Stop making excuses and get up and put yourself to work. Work for the kingdom. I'm not going to pry into anyone's personal life here, but if there's any unemployed people here who don't do much with their days, there is a great work to be done in the kingdom of Yahweh. There is a great need in the church. Get up, get out of your house, and give yourself to the work of the ministry. And those in leadership, elders, ministry leaders, I ask you specifically today, Will you die for your calling? Do you know there is no ministry that will ever live unless somebody's prepared to die for it? And it's not my job to die for your ministry. It's your job to die for your own ministry because you will never succeed, you will never see growth, your ministry will never live unless you die for it. You die to self, you die to your own ambitions, your own desires, your own wants. Ministry is the most important thing in life. And I'm not embarrassed or ashamed to say it. Will you lose yourself in pursuit of it? Are you prepared to put your own ambitions on the line and focus solely on the heavenly commission? Young adults, I ask you guys, are you willing to put your own ambitions and desires on the line for the sake of the heavenly calling. I want to share something that happened to me a couple of months ago. I volunteered to go and work with an organization that was sending lots of uh, medical and educational equipment across to Zanzibar. And they were sending a shipping container out there and I volunteered to go and do some lifting. Uh, not, yeah. Sometimes that's not always the wise thing to do at my age, but anyway. But I, I arrived at about 8 o'clock in the morning, and I, I was told I'd finish by about 12. And when I got there, the only other people that were helping were a group of 8 to 10 Mormons. And these were all young people um, under the age of 25, and there was me. And we spent, <laughs> we spent four hours really lifting some heavy stuff and putting them in the container and it was it was a joy it was it was, it was a great joy because it was a good cause but during the course of those four hours I got to know these young men and young women there was a group of eight to ten, ten of them and, and, the, the, and all the young men and they were aged between 18 and 25 they had their badge on as you probably see in them walking around the streets El and they were all called elders these guys were 18 to 25 and they had elder on the men and the women were sisters and I talk to them and <laughs> I talk to them and I try to find out about them because I don't know much about who, what they were doing or who they were. And what I came to understand was that in the Mormon church, now what I'm going to say here, I'm not advocating the Mormon church, I'm not advocating their, their teaching or their principles, it's just a lesson I learned from that day. When you grow up in a Mormon family, when you reach 18, you can volunteer to become a missionary for two years. And you can only be a missionary if you are between the ages of 18 and 25, or if you are a retired couple. Big difference. And right now, and at any one time, there are 80,000 missionaries posted across the world. 80,000. Before anyone is posted, you are required to go through a thorough course in learning how to share the gospel. And if you, as an 18-year-old man or woman, decide you want to become a missionary, you would approach your elder, your senior elder, and you would tell them of your <coughs> desire, having already spoken to your parents, of course. And then the elders would go away, and they would pray about which country you should go to. They don't decide, parents don't decide, the elders decide. And if they feel that you should go to China and you need to learn the language to go there, you are required to learn the language. 
But if you fill in an application form, you sign up to two years of missionary work in a country that is decided for you. And that might mean learning a language. When they, the, these guys were from all over the world, they were from Germany, they were, there was someone from Japan, that, this group I was working with, they were from all over the world, they were, they were a great bunch. And I also learned that they could only call home on Mondays. <laughs> they could only make one phone call a week to their parents on a Monday. That is to prevent them from getting sidetracked, it's, it's to prevent them from um, getting absorbed in, in the feeling of, of missing them too much. But there was a rule in place. They could also ring on special occasions. They would spend the entire time, two years, learning to work and serve in the community. Their day would begin at half past six in the morning and end at half past ten at night. On going home, they would pursue their career after two years, but the rest of their life would be fully devoted to the church. I was amazed. This was a group of 18 to 25 year olds who volunteered to do that. The point I'm trying to make here is that this is the kind of minister Yeshua is looking for today. Someone who's heard the demand of the sovereign. Someone who counts the cost and invests all energies, desires, passions in pursuit of that one thing, forgetting what is past and pressing on to that which is ahead, never looking behind but always looking forward. Someone who is never ashamed of the testimony of Yeshua. Another thing that happened to me a couple of years ago when I was going to Malawi and talking about not being ashamed and I was I always sit in the aisle seat because I need to get up a few times during the night <laughs> and I was I was sitting or flying across to Kenya through the night and oh, no, actually no, it was a Friday it wasn't quite night time actually and I was in the aisle seat and I was fly, well, the, the plane was up and they were beginning to serve the food um, Kenya Airways this was and across to me from the aisle this gentleman gets up and they're coming down the aisle with the food trolley and he gets his mat out and he kneels in the aisle and he prays. It's a Muslim guy. And everyone had to wait until he had finished praying. They, they didn't ask him to, if he was a Christian, they would have asked him to move, I'm sure. But, <laughs> but they, didn't, they didn't dare ask him to move until he had finished praying. This guy was not ashamed. He didn't care how many hundreds of people on that plane saw him or what the, what the thought of him. He was not ashamed of what he stood for. And sometimes I wonder <coughs> about you and myself and you and I and how sometimes we put our light under a container and we're afraid to show and to shine the light that has been given to us. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Yeshua. For us, the power of Yahweh unto salvation to everyone that believes. Yes. Are you ashamed today of your testimony, brother, sister? That brings me on to my final point, the deceptiveness of the sensual. Verse three, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, they will want to have their ears tickled so they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to fables or myths. This kind of links into my first point. Seasons come throughout all church history when people don't want to hear sound doctrine. They refuse the truth that saves lives, the truth that sanctifies. Back in chapter 2, verse 16, speaking of the church or certain members in the church, Paul was describing these individuals that go after worldly empty chatter which influences them and who in turn seek to bring it into the church and this if left unchecked leads to further ungodliness it's nothing but talk that spreads like gangrene it's deadly sound doctrine is healthy accurate and sound teaching we are in a time when the church at large will not endure sound doctrine Never mind the sinner, the church won't. 
We're in a season like that which Paul is describing, I believe. Doctrine is a bad word. People don't seem to want to hear doctrine anymore and the prevailing to mood in today's culture is that every person should be able to determine truth for him or herself. And this attitude has crept into the church. It's poison to the church. Listen to me. It's poison to the church. In today's modern church, people want a message that makes them feel good. We've heard this this week. They're driven by their sensual desires. They want preachers who promise excitement, success, and prosperity. And they want to jump up and down and feel good about themselves. Get an emotional thrill or feel some kind of hype and self-esteem. That's what so many people are looking for. And a guy by the name of Martin Vincent said this. In periods of unsettled faith, skepticism, and mere curious speculation in matters of religion, teachers of all kinds swarm like flies in Egypt. The demand creates the supply. The hearers invite and shape their own preachers. If the people desire a calf to worship, a ministerial calf maker is easily found. You know, the church is no longer in a precarious position. It's in an outright dangerous position. And it's all because people want ear-tickling teachers. So they run from church to church to accumulate them according to their own feelings and desires. And such churches and such leaders who welcome them get a boost in ego because they see their numbers increasing. And so the ministry continues to perpetuate this watered down message resulting in lots of happy people but very few holy people. And not only do such individuals turn their ears away from the truth, the entire church ministry does exactly the same under the guise of church growth for fear of decreasing numbers. But the payoff to churches and leaders, and it's a bad payoff, is that people do not grow, people do not change, people do not seek Yahweh, they do not know how to spend more than five minutes on their knees, Dasley. They do not know or recognize the voice of the shepherd. They do not overcome David. They do not find the truth in the inward parts, but instead by their actions they embrace, enjoy, and exacerbate the error they've bought into. And I'm saying to you today, my friend, my brother, minister, fellow servant and preacher, if this is the way the church trend is going, we need to just crank up the truth even louder. We need to take it up a notch. We need to shout it from our pulpits. We need it to shout it from the rooftops. We need to know the truth, declare it, sow the seed, and watch the blessing and authority of the Holy Spirit breathe on it. It may cost us, even with our lives, but there is an exceeding great reward waiting for you on the other side. One day, the wheat will be separated from the tares. Truth will be separated from error, true children of Yahweh from illegitimate children. One day the goats and the sheep will be separated in the kingdom and it will all boil down to what we did or didn't do. In conclusion, what happened to Timothy? Where did he end up? Did he fulfill his commission or his purpose? There's an interesting couple of verses in Hebrews chapter 13. First one, verse 22 says, I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. I'm really interested in that. Twelve chapters of Hebrew, have you tried reading them before? And he says, I've written to you briefly. <laughs> you know, um, in today's society, everyone likes a brief, don't they? A 20 minute or a 30 minute sermon. We kind of condition our children to not be able to sit through more than 15 minutes of talking and when the preacher goes on too long, it's the preacher who's at fault. It's the minister who's at fault. It's them who must change. They must 
they must do something about this outrage. Or if he or she doesn't, we just simply move on to another church. No, in Paul's day, I'm not saying Paul was the writer of Hebrews. I used to think he was, but I don't, I'm not so convinced now, actually. But merely 12 chapters of Hebrews, just a mere brief exhortation. But then in, in verse 23, this is what I, what I want to say. is He says, take notice that our brother, Timothy, has been released. Where has where, where Timothy go? Where had he been? Well, he was at the very least under house arrest. Or probably at the worst, he'd been put in one of these prisons. Why? Because he'd been faithful to his solemn charge. He must have been faithful because being in prison meant he must have excited the enemy. You only get into trouble when you excite the enemy. Do you know that? When you get him wound up, and I ask you, have you excited the enemy lately? Have you got him wound up? When did you last excite him by what you've done, or what you've said, or where you've gone? Does he get a reaction when he sees you go onto the streets, Richard, with your Bible, or into the prisons, Claudette and Marvet? Does he react to you when he sees you walk out your house with your Bible in your hand? Do you get a reaction from the enemy? Does he get himself worked up? when he hears you speaking to someone about the faith, when did you last get a backlash from the enemy because of what you have done? Well, Timothy must have excited that old enemy of his because he got himself arrested. But praise Yahweh, Timothy's time was not yet. His work was not yet finished. He'd not quite run the, won the, won the race as Paul had done. He'd not yet fought the fight. He was released from prison. Suffering became, for Timothy, the benchmark of his faithfulness, just as it had been for his beloved mentor, the Apostle Paul. The end of the story, I reckon he must have preached the word in season and out of season. Fellow ministers, I speak to you today. I'm going to give you five Ps. Preach the truth. Preach the truth, that's the first one. Practice the truth. Proclaim the truth. Publish the truth. And finally, prepare to die for the truth. <coughs> Preach, practice, proclaim, publish, prepare to die. The undiluted, uncompromising word of Yahweh is the only sure foundation on which to stand in the season of the last days. This does not change. It has stood the test of time. It's through the word of Yahweh in the hearts and in the hands of Yahweh's people that the church will triumph over adversary and hell. It is through the faithful ministry of that word passed on from generation to generation that the church will continue to grow and grow and become stronger in spite of persecution and suffering, even if we end up in each other's homes on the Sabbath day. Does it really, really matter at the end of the day what happens to these buildings? What's important is that this legacy is passed on from generation to generation. Brother, do not let go of it if you are older in the faith until someone younger has come along and taken a hold of it, until they understand what the doctrine is, understand what the truth is, know how to speak it, know how to preach it. It's through the faithful ministry of the word that the church will continue to grow and grow and the gates of hell will never prevail against the church of Yeshua for he is the one who is building his church through people like you and me. The glory of Yahweh will surely one day fill this earth as the waters cover the sea. And today I'm asking you, leaders in the congregation, elders, deacons, ministry leaders. I feel that you need to make some kind of pledge before Yahweh today. Just in your heart. Whatever I've said applies to you. I'm not going to make any apology for it. 
we need to do something. We need to change something. We need to make some decisions. We need, we need to make a pledge before Yahweh that we will go forward. And I'm going to finish with the words of a song which I've asked Elliot to sing, and it's one we all know and says this. So come on, fellow brethren. Let's get it together. And walk this land in total victory. And so say Yahweh, we're coming. We're going to follow your cloud. Yahweh, lead us on. Yahweh, lead us on. We're coming through. So come on, fellow brethren. Take the hand of the person next to you. Let's get it together. Say that. Come on, fellow brethren. Say that to your brother, your sister. So come on, fellow brethren. Let's get it together. Let's get it together. Let's walk this land in total victory. Let's walk this land in total victory. And so say Yahweh, we're coming. We're coming. We're coming. We're going to follow your cloud. Yahweh, lead us on. Yahweh, lead us on. We're coming through. We're coming through Yahweh once more. So come on, fellow brethren. Let's get it together and walk this land in total victory. And so say Yahweh, we're coming. We're going to follow that cloud. Yahweh, lead us on. Yahweh, lead us on. We're coming through. It's the congregation of Yahweh coming through today. Can I hear it? Can I hear? Do I sense it in my spirit, brother? Can I, can I feel it in my heart? Can I, can I get something from you? Give me something that assures me the congregation of Yahweh is coming through. We're coming through. We're coming through. We're getting it. We get it. We get it. I sometimes worry about what will happen when the likes of Sister Dell and Gloria and these sisters are not around and Brother Andrew, I sometimes worry because they are the example that we need to aspire to. Nothing is ever too much for these, these sisters. Nothing is ever too much. And yet when anything needs doing, who are the ones who are there? It is the sisters and the brothers who are in the 70s and 80s. It's time. It's time. It's time this was handed over. It's time it was in the hands of somebody in the next generation. And don't let go, Sister Dell, until you know it's in the hands. Seriously, come on, seriously, come on, brethren. So come on, fellow brethren. Let's get this together. What do you need to do today? Something needs to break in your life. Something needs to be shattered. Something needs to be broken inside you. Today's the day. Don't leave here until you've done business with Yahweh and you've made that pledge before him, this church would be so different. If you just do what I ask, not from me, but the solemn charges from him. It's the demand of the sovereign.